Okay. All right, so we're having some technical difficulties. We're going to give this a shot. Um, and I'm going to take a moment of personal privilege. Who's a Game of Thrones fan? All right, I have a, no spoilers, I swear, I swear. Okay, so I stayed up late watching last night's episode and it, it all over struck me again. When you get stabbed in the abdomen with a sword, you don't immediately spit up blood. This is true in every movie I've ever seen, every anything I've ever seen. If you get stabbed in the low groin here, you don't spit up blood. You just don't. I'm sorry, that was just my personal thing this morning. I was really mad about it. Uh, anyway, okay, so um, it is a dogma eat dogma world. How does this thing work? Ah, yay, okay. So a little bit about me. Um, I am a tool of the medical industrial complex, and so everything I talk about is going to be related uh, with that sort of, um, oh, thank you, in mind. Um, I am a board certified emergency physician. Um, I'm also human, I make mistakes. Um, all images are either taken by me personally or stolen shamelessly from the internet for inter or educational purposes. And I'm a doctor, but I am not your doctor. If you have specific medical questions, including um, problems of being stabbed in the abdomen, um, please see your doctor. Although I'll hook you up in the short term. Okay, so um, the disease and illness have been um, attributed to many sources throughout um, the millennia because we really kind of didn't understand how the body worked. Kind of like the people who do the stabbing and the barfing of the blood. Um, so people had very little control over their own lives and often did not have the luxury of delving into the cause of diseases because they were so busy trying to make a living. Um, the strategy was often to, often to produce enough family members that uh, enough members would survive into reproductive age. Um, also, one of the problems that they would have at that time, especially studying severe diseases um, and highly communicable ones, um, would be that how do you prevent yourself from getting that disease that you're trying to study? We have very elaborate mechanisms to try to prevent ourselves from dying of the very same disease that we're studying. Ebola, anyone? So anyway, we don't want that to happen. Um, so these were the original uh, sources of our knowledge. Um, demons were blamed, spirits, uh, magic, sorcery, and um, shamans were often used to try to address these issues. So um, Hippocrates was, is credited as the father of modern medicine. And um, he's really one of the first uh, to, or at least the, one of the more famous, to decouple the idea of illness from religion. Um, up until his time, um, um, he really, uh, everyone kind of said what people said, and that's really kind of it. Now, the quote here, neither truly do I count it a worthy opinion to hold that the body of man is polluted by God, the most impure by the most holy. Now, I don't know if how many can read the uh, translator's name there, um, but it's, it's listed as being translated by Charles Darwin Adams, no relation. I looked it up, sorry, I really thought that would have been cool, but that's not true. So um, physiology, anatomy, and knowledge of the number zero were all very limited, uh, given the uh, Greek reverence for death, and um, the bodies were not allowed to be dissected. And um, so at least Hippocrates did observe and define patterns of disease, which gave us a lot of the words that we use today to describe illness, acute, chronic, epidemic, endemic, things that we use every day now. Um, and it was, it's the same, and, and the other thing that's really interesting um, while I was doing some research for this talk was that we use some of the same techniques for things like shoulder reduction that they used, that he used as a matter of fact. He had, there was this weird contraption where they had the, the axilla, they had a bar in the axilla and you'd pull down and do the, the regular internal rotation, external rotation that I would do to reduce a shoulder. I thought that was cool. So he developed a code of, of ethics by which we conduct ourselves in medicine even today, or try to. Um, there were many medical schools, but the one on COS, COS, um, that he founded in 400 BCE was the best known at the time, and he was its greatest teacher. I always kind of think about HIPAA, you know, um, the Health Care, the Health Information Privacy Act, kind of as a throwback to his name. Um, I, I don't know if that was intentional. Um, but one of my favorite things that he insisted on was that doctors appear well and well fed. Got that covered. So anyway, um, so, 
So one of his hypotheses was that, okay, so he kicks the gods out of medicine, which is new, um, but he still held forth about the effect of pneuma, which is air, phlegm, bile, blood. Still, it's, this is all called vitalism, and um, he also discusses the effects of wind, mucus, clotted blood, etc., and a lot of emphasis was placed on the liver and the spleen and their venous connections. Um, well, but at least there are no magic pixies involved, right? So he attempted to actually ground the hypothesis of disease in the observable world. Um, vitalism is this hypothesis that living organisms are somehow fundamentally different than non-living organisms um, uh, because they contain some sort of non-physical element or are governed by different principles. Uh, this, uh, the four humors, black bile, phlegm, yellow bile, blood, these determine health, both mental and physical. And since most of the thinking at this time was symbolic, they were often associated with the four elements, earth, air, fire, water, um, to associate with these humors. So heat could be used to purify water. Well, that's actually not bad because boiling really does reduce contaminants in water. Now, it's not quite as good a trick as turning water into wine, but it's a close second. Um, so traditional Chinese medicine does use some of these same nonsensical principles, and occasionally it would stumble onto a truth just like the water to want, I mean, water to clean water, <laughs> wishful thinking. Um, so, but without scientific principles, how can we maintain consistency and pass information to others with fidelity? So, there's earth, air, fire, uh, wind, and fire, and uh, there's a little water in there too. Um, <laughs> So there was a hypothesis that the four elements and the four humors are associated. The symbolism is with many of these nonsensical analogies now accepted as reality. So it's poetic, but completely wrong. So organs were also attributed with these elements, but brain, heart, liver, and spleen would be the worst name for a rock band ever. So to, in, to treat an imbalance of these humors, it required techniques like cupping, bleeding, which we actually kind of do use in, in uh, uh, hemochromatosis, but we're not going to talk about that. So um, they also loved em emetics, making you throw up, and purging tonics, which will make you poop. So while demons were no longer blamed, uh, there were still imagined causes that did not cor correlate with reality. And if you're lucky, the cure didn't actually kill you, <laughs> or at least, you know, kill your patient. Um, because uh, despite accusation, and despite accusations by people who were trying to sell you something, um, where's Yvette? <laughs> so she did a whole discussion on, on people who were trying to sell you stuff. But we, we really do want to not keep our patients sick. We really want to make things better. And we're trying to achieve cure without actually killing our patients. So while this was a more rational approach, it did yield some results. There were risks. Bleeding, of course, could lead to, uh, you know, death, um, uh, obviously. But some of the medicinal herbs employed at the time could have serious consequences because they have actual pharmacologic effects. Opium, known for millennia for pain control, um, it, uh, in arsenic, which is very dangerous, um, top poison was actually a very favored poison. But um, we did discover that there are some, some preparations of arsenic that can help cure syphilis. So um, these were dangerous, though, and um, not well controlled and not well described in the very physical chemical sense. So Hippocrates, though, also prescribed exercise, massage, hygiene, diet, and some of the orthopedic practices that I mentioned a little while ago were the same. So the Greeks were the first to decouple gods from medicine, but the Romans were not to be outdone. So um, Galen here, uh, who was born in 129 CE, um, was a Roman who built upon Hippocrates to develop hypotheses about medical care. His father had a dream in 145 CE, and we know how well those work, um, in which the god Asclepius appeared and told his father to send little Galenus to study medicine, which he did. So traveling all over Greece, he learned much about the older traditions, and he, including examinations of monkeys and pigs, which are surprisingly similar to humans in many um, respects and in our government. Um, um, but he, he traveled extensively and then ended up as a physician for gladiators. Well, he tended closely to their wounds, and uh, he considered these windows into the body. Um, the death rates for his gladiators were far lower than his predecessors, which earned him a reputation for skill. So he also uh, recorded information for us. So he recorded, say, the, uh, the Antoine... 
Antonin plague in 165 uh, to 168 CE. It killed about three and a half million to five million people. I know. <laughs> so, and his detail, his notes were detailed enough that we can figure out it was probably smallpox. So he was one of the earliest to make these accurate recorded observations. And he was a skilled anatomist, um, and he demonstrated many organ functions by torturing animals, and he made numerous and accurate discoveries and wrote prolifically. So even though a fire destroyed more than half of his writings, we still have um, enough to keep him and elevate him to one of the gods of medicine. So his ideas were accepted for almost 1,400 years until Avicenna. Now, the Avicenna is the Latinized name of his um, Arabic name, which is Ibn Sina, um, and I'm certain I'm butchering that uh, pronunciation. But um, he was born in Persia in 980. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, he was born in Persia in 980, um, and his own autobiography uh, say, says that he memorized the Quran by the age of 10. Um, he received input from many sources, including learning arithmetic from an Indian grocer, and medicine from a traveling scholar. Um, he read Aristotle's metaphysics and had a hard time understanding, but then would go pray for understanding, and then finally read commentary by a philosopher named Faraby, and he was so excited that he thanked God. I don't think he th thanked Faraby, but anyway, so um, he started studying the medicine at 16, and beca because it's so easy, he had mastered it by the time he was 18. Um, he often treated people without payment, which many of us still do. Um, <clears throat> besides philosophy and medicine, he also wrote about astronomy and alchemy, ge geography, geology, psychology, Islamic theology, um, et cetera, et cetera. He was a devout Muslim, however, and he sought to reconcile rational philosophy with Islamic theology. Um, his aim was to prove the existence of God and his creation of the world, scientifically and through reason and logic. He was also quite fond of food, drink, and promiscuous sex, but who's not? So he considered astronomy as separate from astrology, and he claimed to have been to observed an actual transit of Venus. Uh, well, this might have been possible because there was actually a transit of Venus, but some of the modern uh, scholars debate whether or not he could have seen it from where he was. Um, his medical texts were unusual in that we're, there was a controversy between Galen, the god of medicine, and Aristotle, um, especially on views such as anatomy. He preferred to side with Aristotle, but was adaptable enough that he could incorporate new discoveries. So Avicenna was a comparative rock star among Islamic uh, scholars and writers in Europe because he combined Aristotle's philosophical writings with Galen's medical writings. These were combined into his comprehensive and logically organized canon of medicine. His influence following translation of the canon was such that from the early 14th to the mid 16th centuries, he was ranked with Hippocrates and Galen as one of the acknowledged authorities, Princeps Medicorum, Prince of Physicians. So he did adhere to the dogma of his time with a few challenges to Aristotle, but his writings began to apply methodology to organizing the knowledge of the time and to develop early scientific inquiry. He is credited with the invention even of steam distillation, which I think is amazing. Okay, so this is his canon of medicine. It was completed in about 1020. Um, it synthesized all of the known knowledge of medicine and surgery at the time, and canon here is used in the sense of law, like this is the law of medicine. So, um, and this is the first page of the text. So it still carried a lot of the vitalism that was found in the earlier hypotheses of Galen and the naturalism of Aristotle. It was a lot more um, uh, concise than Galen's corpus. So uh, it's interesting, like this is still used in certain traditional medicine practices in India. Um, I couldn't tell if they use actual germ theory too, or, and, the, and this is a supplement, or if this is the only um, method, but like, uh, I, I, does anybody listen to Mark Cl Chrislip and uh, the podcast? I see a couple of hands. Anyway, so um, one of my favorite quotes of his is that adding cow pie to apple pie does not make the apple pie better. <laughs> so adding nonsense to actual science does not make the science better. So the dogma was still present, but the chinks were starting to appear in the armor. So Ibn al-Nafis um, was uh, 12, 13, born in 1213, <clears throat> and though he studied medicine, he also studies law and theology. Um, he probably dissected humans at this point, um, although it was still forbidden, um, and he was the first to describe the human circulatory system. Almost 400 years before William Harvey, who is a European um, uh, physician who gets credit, 
Um, he specified he did not perform dissections, uh, but many think that's the only way he really could have come up with some of his discoveries. Um, and he might have been able to derive some of these informa this information from surgery. So we can't really say for sure, but he certainly challenged Galen's uh, longstanding conclusions. And this sets him apart as forming his own conclusions based on the evidence available. Um, he did also practice religious law in Cairo, but he seemed to keep them separate. He had this whole, I don't know, cognitive dissonance or something he was able to reconcile. So um, he described correctly the cardiopulmonary recess, uh, circulation that Galen had flubbed massively. Galen imagined these little magic pores that went between the septum. It was stupid. Anyway, so, but he was the first to really challenge, well, it wasn't stupid, it was just wrong. So he was the first to truly challenge Galen's assertion and paved the way for medieval medicine. So the Roman Empire dissolved in the late 400s, about 476 or so, and left the rest of Europe to degenerate into fiefdoms, and people were just trying to survive, basically. There was little information transfer, and the Catholic Church grew to fill this void left by the Roman government. Um, advances in medicine suffered in a huge way, and most medical practice was decreed by the church rather than by scientific data. No autopsies or dissections meant that little about anatomy could be learned, and disease was now seen as a punishment for sin. Intercessory prayer was the primary cure, and we know how well that works. So most of the sciences suffered because there really weren't many who spoke the requisite languages of literature and few centers of learning. So Charlemagne came along after Europe began to get its collective shit together, and he sponsored schools and universities to rebuild and started expanding about, oh, about 800 CE or so. This is the Carolinian Renaissance that you may have heard of. So of course, these were all within the scope of a monastery, cathedral, or a noble court, partly because these are the folks that had the money, and also they had space. Um, the clergy was barely literate at the time, and he standardized education um, and writing, as a matter of fact. He, uh, Charlemagne was the one that introduced the style of writing we still use with capital letters, punctuation, and um, I think that's very interesting. So during his lifetime, some did realize that care for the sick on a practical level was necessary, which required the study of historical texts. And there was a practical need to know arithmetic and astronomy so they could figure out when to pray and when Easter should be. So the monks were the literate of the society, and when uh, since they had these specific time needs, and thus were able to read the more ancient texts uh, and apply the knowledge therein. Herbal and so-called natural treatments were framed as being provided by God to assist man, so they were given a pass. And this scuola medica sal, anybody speak Italian? Because I got nothing. No? OK, well, whatever. So it was founded in the ninth century <laughs> and continued for 400 years. The first formal medical school was built on logic, evidence and the principles of science, but it was located in Salerno, Italy, at the site of a former monastery. Um, it incorporated and synthesized teachings from Greek and Roman practices, as well as with the Arab and the Jewish lessons. Even included women in the classes, and they introduced dissections as part of the curriculum. The legend and the founding was, uh, I, I think this is fun, so of an injured Greek runner, Pontus, taking shelter under an aqueduct during a thunderstorm and a Roman runner, Solernums, coming along to investigate and treat his wound. A Jewish traveler, Hellenus, and an Arab named Abdella also came. When they found they were all interested in medicine, they founded a medical school. And then presumably Salazar Slytherin, Rowena Ravenclaw, Goodrich Gryffindor, and Helga Hufflepuff joined later. So the European universities were taking advantage of reasonably accurate translations of Greek, Arabic, and Jewish scientific and philosophical texts. And by 1300 had produced many of their own thinkers and were more, um, who were more assiduously promoted re reason, science, and logic. They were still using Hippocrates, Galen, et al. as texts, um, but the, and the curriculum consisted of three years of philosophy, five years of medicine and surgery, and one year of practice with an elderly physician. They planned an autopsy every five years, which is, you know, in our medical school, in mine, I've done three cadaver dissections. Um, plus, I was a teaching assistant in gross anatomy, so I helped with probably 20 others. And so that was uh, a big difference if, if you just stood around and kind of watched versus actually doing. Um, we still do sort of small group training, like usually about three to six per cadaver, so um, FYI. Okay, so uh, Benedictine abbess Hildegard of Bingen, or Bingen, received visions, and she was afraid at this time, she um, was afraid to communicate to anyone until Pope Eugenius uh, decreed that her visions were messaged from God, and she was free to share them. 
So she shared her visions and then superimposed a theological interpretation onto them as she was deeply steeped in this Catholic idolatry and lore. So it's no surprise then that she also maintained this vitalist perspective in her approach to medical care, but she focused her efforts uh, based on readings in the library as well as her own experiences treating patients and using herbs from the garden and preparations used in the infirmary. She also recorded her observations, which is unusual because they show areas of medieval medicine that were not well documented because the practitioners, mainly women, rarely wrote in Latin. She still made specific recommendations based on an imbalance of humors, but may have also included good information such as the boiling of the water before drinking it. Um, let's see, she is quoted with the phrase, woman may be made from man, but no man can be made without a woman. She's not wrong, so. Alrighty then. So, William Ockham, um, this sketch is from a manuscript. This is his own, this is not a, a portrait of him. This is from his own um, um, Summa Logicae, 1341. So he was an, Eng an English Franciscan monk who believed that science was a matter of discovery and religion was a matter of faith. Non-overlapping magisteria, anyone? So, um, he also believed in church-state separation and separation of spiritual and earthly rule. While not actually a doctor and not actually involved in the practice of medicine, he is honored in the axiom widely quoted in medical training that the explanation requiring the fewest number of assumptions is most likely the correct one. Occam's razor is a helpful decision-making tool. Interestingly, the practice of medicine relies more on detailed observation, and though vitalism is still alive and well at this time, Europe was about to endure a devastating setback. Plague arrived in Europe and struck just as science was beginning to recover. And since the religion was so deeply entrenched and disease was still seen as punishment for sins, people flocked to houses of worship where they were sure to infect others. Um, there had been other pandemics, most notably in 588 that spread into France, and there had been an earlier plague of Justinian in 541, which killed about 40% of the population of Constantinople, not Istanbul. Um, it went on to kill about 25% of the, oh, I'm so glad somebody got that. Okay, so uh, it went on to kill about 25% of the people in the Mediterranean. The first year, the plague of Justinian, probably also bubonic plague, uh, killed about 25 million, which was about 13% of the world's population. During his plague, Justinian still commanded his annual revenues uh, from the populace because the tax revenues were shrinking, because everyone was dying. But he had budgeted for Hagia Sophia and fought several wars, and he did the money. So as the tax base shrank, he of course cut payments to teachers and doctors. I guess you don't need them when everybody's dying. So, um, so plague has been used to describe widespread illnesses such as malaria, cholera, measles, syphilis, and smallpox. And each of these is problematic, but none has been as devastating as bubonic plague, Yersinia pestis. So anyway, the 1347 bubonic plague started in the Middle East and spread from there. These are the lines of, of infection. From 1347 to 1352, the world's population may have been reduced by about 20%, from about 450 million to about 350 to 375 million. Plague is periodically returned with devastating consequences. So at that time, no one really knew what caused it, apart from divine judgment. Now some tried to run, some tried to atone, and some, Muslims in particular, just endured God's harsh punishment. As time progressed, God became less the focus of the cause of disease, and the devil began to become a scapegoat. And the solution was, of course, to kill the devil in the form of people one didn't like. Jews, witches, heretics, all suffered and were murdered as scapegoats. Plague still kills about 8 to 10 percent of those it infects in remote areas without access to medical care, particularly in Africa, and infects an average of seven people per year in the U.S. All of those are in the Southwest. So this was one of our ways uh, to try to combat. And during the ravages of plague, there was a new class of doctors called plague doctors who were given permission to practice, although they were really more like demographers going around counting the dead and sick. They developed this bizarre costume that they used to try to protect themselves from plague. The beak was filled with sweet-smelling spices and the mask was meant to protect from the miasmas of the air that they thought caused the disease. The coat was waxy to protect the wearer and the, and the stick was so they could direct patients without having to touch them, you could just poke them. So plague doctors were also known as empirics and they often lacked medical training. But this may not have been such a bad thing as they had not been steeped in the Galen worship that other doctors had been subjected to. They were also permitted to perform autopsies, um, which was previously forbidden by the church. Anything to find a cure, all hands on deck. And no one really understood the germ theory of disease yet. 
The mere fact that they were wearing special gear, though, implies that they understood that God wasn't really involved in the transmission of this disease. They did, uh, they still did things we now know are dangerous or complete waste of time, such as bloodletting, applying leeches, but at least they were looking for a solution. So, Ambroise Paré, I thought this was a little more interesting than his portrait, um, but this is a drawing uh, from his original work describing a massive multigravita woman. That means a woman who's had a lot of babies. This is Dorothea, an Italian woman who gave birth to 20 children in two pregnancies. Right, let's just take a moment for that. I've got like four minutes, but wow, okay. So the first was nine and the second was 11. This hula hoop structure that she's got is a girdle to support her abdomen and extends all the way up around her neck. That's a little more interesting than the usual portrait. So Paré was a plague doctor and accidentally used his scientific method when he revisited a battlefield. Uh, some of the injured soldiers had the traditional oil cautery applied to their wounds, while others had the Roman technique of egg, white, turpentine, and oil of roses applied to the wounds. When he returned, the cauterized group were doing much worse. Um, he also used ligatures that are ties to stop, to stop the bleeding from arteries um, rather than cautery, which often failed and caused more deaths. Uh, he introduced observation into the canon of medical research. He also proved that be bezoars could not cure poisons when he offered them to a condemned man uh, and if the that had been poisoned, and if he uh, got cured by the bezoar, he got to go free. Guess what happened? Died. Okay, so right around the same time, there was a juggernaut in the development that would place medicine squarely in the camp of reason and dethrone a god. Enter Vesalius. Dutch physician who graduated from medical school in 1537 and published his first anatomy book in 1543. He had noted discrepancies between Galen's texts and his own observations, and he'd come to realize that Galen had made assumptions about human anatomy from extrapolations of animal anatomy. Galen had not been allowed to dissect human, and so he had made some fundamental errors. Since Galen had been re uh, revered for almost 1,300 years with only minor chinks in the armor, contradicting him was scandalous. For example, the notion that men and women had the same number of ribs, <gasps> shocking, absolutely shocking, but it was true, and Vesalius could count. So the dogma of more than a millennium was shattered, and although there were huge fragments of nonsense and pseudoscience, he ushered in a new era and established the modern science of anatomy. He wasn't the first to do dissections or illustrations, but his were so detailed and beautiful that his popularity went far and above all others. In 1555, one of his detractors even claimed that the human body had changed since the time of Galen. Yeah. So he was working as a personal physician to the king of Spain. Traditional accounts have him uh, of his death start with allegations that he dissected a living human. Oh, that's actually kind of a big deal, um, which was frowned upon by the church. Predictably. <laughs> I can't imagine. So predictably, the Spanish Inquisition, which nobody expects, right? So um, began to place him in their sights. So in 1564, he decided he needed to go on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land on a medicinal plant finding expedition while he sent his wife and daughter to Brussels. On the return to Padua, where he was planning to accept a professorship, he was stranded on a Greek island and, a sh and uh, in a shipwreck, and he died. The god killer is buried somewhere in Corfu. So by challenging the dogma of over a thousand years, he ushered in the modern age of medicine. Though there have been hiccups along the way, medicine has marched inexorably forward, and though there are still challenges to medical dogma, these topple relatively quickly with the uh, supporting support of evidence. Um, honorable mention for challenging medical dogma to Parsilus, who appeared to be part of the not always right but never in doubt camp. He was a contemporary of Vesalius who famously burned books by Galen, Hippocrates, and Avicenna and correctly believed that keeping wounds clean helped them heal and that syphilis was transmitted by contact. He also believed in his own vitalist philosophy, which is a complex amalgam of sulfur, salt, and mercury, as well as prophecy, astrology, and a whole bunch of other nonsense. So if a plant looked like a particular body, fruit, then it, body part, then it cured that part. By this logic, then a kiwi fruit should cure all diseases of the testicles, right? It makes no sense. So he did recommend iron for poor blood, which can work, and if you've been subjected to bloodletting, replacing your iron may actually make things better. So evidence does indicate that he was right about this. So we do need to challenge dogma when we find it, to test its assertions and follow the evidence where it leads. Are there any questions? Okay. Thank you.